What's happening, everyone? Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of The Sabbath Stones alongside in the co-captain's chair, as always, Mr. Chris Allo, the king himself. What's happening, my friend? What's happening, Pete? Thanks, as always, for having me. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. So to talk Black Sabbath with you, my friend. No and, doubt. Uh, we actually have some Sabbath stuff in the news of late, right? So it makes yep. this all timely. It's probably a couple of weeks past being brand new, but still uh, better late than never, I always say. We got, uh, for fans of the Tony Martin era, we've got finally this box set called, uh, they're calling it Anno Domine, the, uh, what is it, 1980? 1989 to 1995. Yeah, right. So, um, so this is basically taking a look at everything from um post not the first album i mean that's the kind of weird thing about it so we're we're not looking at the eternal idol in this set because right. that's already been released to me that's a little weird right because if you're going to do a box set of the tony martin era you got to have that album but we're going to go headless cross and on till forbidden so that's basically what this is uh wait what's the street date of this again uh may 31st all right so we got a little bit we got a little bit of time so uh yeah i mean i don't know about you but I'm looking at everything that's included in this box set. A little lackluster for me. Pete, if we're being honest, and I know our viewers like when we be honest, yeah. uh, this box set is a completely what I expected, <laughs> but at the same time, it is totally underwhelming. I mean, literally, it's, it's Headless Cross tier and Cross Purposes remastered. It's the... It's the Forbidden Remix, which we've heard about for a number of years. That's kind of exciting. And literally only three bonus tracks. Um, it's got Cloak and Dagger, which I have on this uh, uh, Headless Cross uh, CD single from years ago. Um, it's um, the Japanese bonus track, What's the Use, which was on the, uh, the Japanese print of uh, Cross Purposes. And... Um, uh, was it Loser Gets It All, which was the uh, Japanese track on um, Forbidden, but was also came out on this, uh, a pretty interesting compilation called The Sabbath, uh, the Sabbath Stones. No, no, <laughs> no less. Where we got the name. <laughs> right. So um, it's like, okay, gosh, guys, you really, you know, you're, you're giving us next to nothing. nothing. You know, uh, it does not have I, the one thing I was really surprised to see it didn't have. Um, Sabbath did famously record uh, their sets, some of their sets when they were in Russia and they put uh, two live tracks on the feels good to me uh, CD single, which was heaven and hell and paranoid. I was surprised that's not on there. And of course, a lot of people have asked, well, where's Cross Purposes Live? Yeah. Um, I have already heard the rumor that uh, this is going to get reissued on its own. Okay. Tony Martin himself has even commented that he's heard that rumor that this is coming uh, later on. But yeah, just looking at it as it is, gosh, it's it's pretty disappointing. Because I don't know about you, but I don't get excited for remasters anymore unless there's some extra shit on there, because to me, a remaster, I struggle to hear differences on a lot of these remasters. A remix is a different story. Correct. To Absolutely. me, the only really intriguing thing here is to hear Forbidden remixed, because, hey, you can only improve on that, right? Yeah. So that to me, it's like, all right, I might sold enough to buy the whole set just for that. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't I'm like gonna forbidden buy enough as it is, right? For, listen, song. forbidden sucks. I hate it. I put neck and neck forbidden and never say die. I think I would edge forbidden just above never say die, but man, they're both terrible. You know, I thought the same thing because I'm like, well, sure, a remix of forbidden, that sounds cool, but you're not recutting the songs or redoing the songs. The songs still suck. I'm sorry, sorry, Tony Martin. You know, uh, songs like uh, Rusty Angels and uh, Illusion of Power. It's it's not good. Yeah. It's not a good record. So sure, remix it. Okay, yeah, I'll buy it again. But yeah, it's disappointing. It comes with a 40-page book. Okay. A Headless Cross tour book replica. I already have the original. And a replica tour poster. I already have the original. 
So yeah, considering there's 80 minutes of material on each CD and there's literally the three extra tracks and just that remix of Forbidden, it's a bummer. I mean, um, I wish, I was arguing with some knucklehead the other day, uh, I wish they were remixing Headless Cross because I love the songs on Headless Cross, True. but I don't like the production. Yeah, The keyboards are too heavy. I don't like the the polish the the multi-tracked backing vocals on, on everything it, to me it sounds like they were trying to do white snake 87 which is great for white snake but it's that's too it's too polished for uh for black sabbath yeah i don't know it's like this box is screaming for a, a whole live set from yes. whatever tour i don't really care uh to me, again, I know different record label and all that kind of stuff, but man, a Tony Martin era box set without Eternal Idol just is not complete. Right. As far as well, I'm it, concerned. It's I, been I brought understand up a the lot. logistics of all of it. I get yeah. it. But it's like, I don't know, because quite frankly, I don't have the Eternal Idol originals re-release set from a bunch of years ago. I never got it. Now, oh, okay. I'm sure it's still out there. You can probably get it, but maybe it actually was. It came out, I believe, in the UK. You know, like 2010 or 2011, yeah. and I think it was out of print. It just did come back into print not that long ago, so you can definitely still get it. And it's worth getting to me uh, just to have the Ray Gillen Ray version. Ray Gillen stuff, yeah. Because the Ray Gillen, the Ray Gillen version of Eternal Idol is great. Yeah, because I have like boot, I have a bootleg version of that, so it'd be kind of nice. To yes. Do, I think that's... Likewise. When they released it, it's all cleaned up and it sounds pretty yes. good. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, I actually, since we're talking bootlegs, I just ordered a different bootleg of Ray Gillen doing uh, Eternal Idol because, uh, yeah, there are multiple versions out there. Right. Um, but even this... I, I think you have one of these, Pete. I got one of these not too long ago. This is just called the Black Sabbath box, which is this terrible name, but it's it's a six disc box set, and there's um, one, two, uh, three CDs worth of Tony Martin live material. So yeah, and it's excellent quality. I mean, they 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 could have put a ton of live stuff on there. To me, I'm assuming the reason they didn't is because if they're putting cross purposes on its own, I'm guessing they were thinking, well, if we give them all Tony Martin singing War Pigs and Heaven and Hell and Paranoid, then who's going to, you won't need cross purposes. Only the diehards will need it. And that could be that, or it could be a, uh, a publishing thing, you know, whereas the, the publishing goes back to Ozzy and Dio on all the other stuff. And yeah. there are legalities <laughs> with the whole Sharon Osbourne thing. So who knows? But they certainly could have put more. I mean, I don't have it in front of me, but I have that whole Forbidden Rough Mix um, CD. And I'm sure there are alternate versions of Tear and Headless Cross that they they could have put on there. So, yeah, it really is quite disappointing but having said that yeah i'm st I'm still gonna buy it <laughs> i don't think i'm gonna buy the vinyl i think for this i'm only gonna buy the cd um because i have headless cross and tear on vinyl i think i have cross purposes i don't think i ever got a forbidden um you know 1995 nobody was buying records no. um so i don't i don't think i don't even know if forbidden was ever officially um pressed on vinyl back then and i don't i don't need it to just for that I'm, I'm i'm good enough so were you surprised at all when they announced i mean I, we knew this was coming but you and i talked i think on a previous episode we yes. talked how we thought born again was next well the thing that is crazy here is when tony iomi made the announcement on new year's eve he said yeah there's a there's a black sabbath box set coming in may but he never said Tony Martin. And, and there was a previous interview that I watched or listened to rather, uh, Tony Iommi was on the Eddie Trunk show. And he said the next release, because we are going in order after Live Evil was born again. So what happened there? I mean, we it was how many years ago where he talked about the born again tapes were discovered? Okay, 
So now you're doing the Martin box set. And then, okay, so is Cross Purposes Live the next one? Uh, and the, to me, the whole, na- the whole, the whole 1989 to 1985, or 1995 rather, like even including that is just stupid. Because what about Dehumanizer? That's right in there. Yeah, yeah. So is there going to be another deluxe version of Dehumanizer? I know there was one not long ago, just like we got the Eternal Idol one not long ago. So, I mean, listen, all of these Sabbath reissues have been very uneven. So I I wish whoever was doing the Deep Purple ones was in charge of doing the Sabbath ones. (laughs) Because, man, the purple guys seem to do it right. Yes, those are all very, very good. Yeah. yeah. So I, okay. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. But, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick it up. Uh, I'm curious now, is Cross Purposes, uh, for those that, that don't remember or didn't get this, this one, Cross Purposes Live, and it's terrible. It's practically the same cover as the other one, which in itself is a cu- cover from the Scorpions. Um, it came in a big box. Yeah, that's the one. It had, had a VHS and a CD that had 13 of the 16 songs. So to me, it would make sense if you're going to reissue it to do it as a double CD. The whole, the whole show. Yeah. And then do they include a DVD and or a Blu-ray? But, you know, there have been other, uh, and the first one that comes to mind is Epica. You know, there have been other reissues of stuff that had a, a, a live, vhs years ago and now it's just because dvds are so dead it's just uh, there's no dvd of it there's just yeah. just get the audio and then that's it that's it so it'll be interesting to see we'll see we'll see so that's what's coming up in yeah. the black sabbath in the very near future so now we're going to kind of talk about we're going to go back in time uh you know chris and i were talking about uh black sabbath's performance at live aid <laughs> 1985 which i still remember quite fondly because i remember it was in the summertime and uh i was staying with my aunt and uncle and cousins in long island for uh, about a month in the summer i was working out there and i was dating a girl out there and stuff so that's why i was there and uh, i remember like waking up on that saturday morning having breakfast and turning on the tv and there they were and yeah. that was like the greatest day of my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember it was a, it was a hot summer uh, it July. It was a Saturday. Uh, yeah, yeah, I got up early. It was on multiple channels uh, for you know it was on MTV. Um, I think Channel Five here in New York carried some of it, and I know at night WABC ran some of it too. And um, I think Joan Baez opened, and I, I wanted to see four acts. Uh, I wanted to see Judas Priest, Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, and Madonna. Just because I thought Madonna was hot at the time. I mean, I don't know. I was, a, I was a kid. I was an idiot. I don't think she's hot anymore. But um, I remember both Maiden, I'm sorry, both Sabbath and Priest, yeah, came on early. And it was a hot day. We didn't have air conditioning. We had a swimming pool. So... I wound up jumping in the pool and spending most of the day in the pool and missing Madonna and uh, didn't catch Led Zeppelin until I borrowed a VHS of a, of a friend who taped Live Aid uh, a couple months later. And that was that was a sloppy, sloppy mess. Um, yeah, well, I mean, you know, when you when you do a little bit of the reading up on it, you know, Tony talks yeah. about his book about how uh, they basically... <laughs> They went to do some rehearsal and they 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 dicked around for a little bit for an hour and then they get, just got drunk and that was that and they just wound up you know just bullshitting and talking and reminiscing and then they got up the next morning they were all hung over and they went out and played and well uh, but I think the Sabbath performance was 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 very good I think that just the Zeppelin one was a mess oh well, the Zeppelin one was totally a mess too. total mess but they, yeah it was fun uh, I mean you could tell they didn't rehearse all that much but. Quite frankly, they played those songs a million times before. So even though they hadn't played them together in a while, I think it was still awesome. It yeah, still be oh yeah, the Zeppelin performance was was crazy. It was dre- it was, dre- it was still dre- cool though. But yeah, yes, was, yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, it was it was it's just it was a weird time, right? Because we had they had been apart for a number of years, and obviously Ozzy was riding really high at the time. 
Right. Yep. The, the, so, this was their first performance since uh, December 1978, which yeah. was the uh, the end of the Never Say Die tour. Yeah. And um, th- there was a di- like we were mentioning with the different channels, there was a couple different feeds, and I just recently watched the the Japanese feed um, because it had Chevy Chase introducing them. Yeah. And he said something like, yeah, this this band set the standard for heavy metal. And he introduced them as Black Sabbath featuring Ozzy Osbourne, right. which was interesting. Which, and yeah, you have to know how much did Chevy Chase even know about Black Sabbath to begin with? Who, who knows? That, it almost screams like someone who doesn't know shit about, you know, knows who Ozzy is, but maybe never listened to Sabbath before. And then right. so that's how he introduced her. Was he told to do that? I don't know. Maybe I was going to say, yeah, he, he was probably given a cue card before <laughs> going out. Uh, and yeah, they did. They did the three songs, Children of the Grave, Iron Man and Paranoid, uh, which again, on the Japanese feed that has all of Children of the Grave and Iron Man, but didn't have Paranoid. But you could see Paranoid as a a separate video um i i think the band looked three of the four guys looked great uh tony iomi looked like a rock star with yeah. his uh the coat with the crosses sunglasses and the, and the, the thick sunglasses and the fringe <laughs> hung over or not he looked apart right yeah. looked apart sounded great geezer was thumping away with his red leather uh pants i gotta say i don't think bill ward ever looked cooler ever in the history of sabbath he was in trim and he just, was trim he, black shirt black pants mustache long black flowing hair and holy shit i think he was the superstar that night pounding those drums which is weird though because literally uh two years before not even quite you know he couldn't even go and do the born again tour because right. he's in such bad shape so yeah. really he got himself in tip-top shape. In fighting shape for sure yeah 100 percent. i mean you know everybody jokes but it, it's true i mean in watching the video ozzy looks exactly like my mother dressed in 1985 yeah he had the frosted highlights yeah. the big poofy hair this enormous shiny, <laughs> shiny coat with uh shoulder pads you know what wide arms i mean it was ridiculous <laughs> you know it's it, one of those oh yeah your wife must have dressed you because the other three guys look great they that looks like black sabbath and you look terrible you like, like but again sabbath. this this is ozzy like this is yes black true moon, ultimate sin era. ultimate sin era <laughs> so like. that's what he looked like it's yeah. it's it's true yeah i thought i thought you know i mean i thought they they sounded fine it was just so cool to see them i think looking back on it now um almost an odd choice to play children of the grave as opposed to war pigs but maybe from a time perspective i mean war pigs is a lot longer of a song maybe it makes sense but um i think it's just cool they gave them three songs right well if if i'm not mistaken i think that was the gimmick that every band was given three songs and it was like within 15 or 20 minutes something like that i forget what it was yeah um but yeah you're right war pigs probably would have made more sense but then again, you know, when, when Ozzy broke away from Sabbath, the, the only three staples for years, he did Children of the Grave, Iron Man, and Paranoid. So maybe it was more based on what he had, had been used to singing, right? Yeah. As and you're right. Also, too, it is, it was, it's a lot shorter. Yeah. Yeah. So but pretty- yeah, I thought, I thought they sounded great. And, it, you know, it would have been interesting had they kept it together and reunited and this was um there was uh, several attempts for them to reunite um i mean i was i was going going through the books again the the iron man by tony iomi um into the void from geezer butler which we reviewed not long ago and even re-going through uh the great book from from martin popoff uh born again black sabbath in the 80s and yeah, it was th- three times previously. They met in uh, late 1982, and uh, Tony met Ozzy, and they talked about doing a uh, a tour and a live album together, which is interesting because had that happened, that they wouldn't have gotten, we wouldn't have gotten Live Evil and Speak of the Devil. But uh, 
uh, Sabbath uh, with Dio already had recorded and owed Warner Brothers Live Evil. That was already in the uh, in the pipeline, so that w that was not going to happen. And then they met in uh, in, in early '83 in the Geezer book. He said that uh, they talked to Ozzy at uh, at their hotel room in early '83. They talked for hours in the middle of the night, and then Ozzy took off. And then again in 1984, uh, Tony Iommi said that they uh, they met with Ozzy uh, soon after Ian Gillen left, and they had talked. And the plan was that they were going to reunite in 1985. They were like, okay, let's let's do it. In, you know, in about a year. Um, but Sharon Osbourne had uh, didn't want to do it with Don Arden, her father. Of course, Sharon's name is Sharon Arden. Uh, because Don Arden was managing Sabbath, and Sharon, of course, managed um, Ozzy. Yeah, it would have been interesting had that happened. I mean, when you really look at it, so Live Evil happens, there's all this excitement about Sabbath playing together again, and, you know, Sabbath not being as successful at the time as Ozzy in his solo career, they were probably hoping that would happen. Ozzy decides not to go through with it and he goes back to doing what he's doing. So you have Sabbath left there. Right. Okay, well, we still need a fucking singer, right? Right. <laughs> right. And then eventually Geezer decides, I'm not waiting around. Bill obviously is doing his own thing. So then we get the initial proposed Tony solo album, which then becomes Seven Star, a Black Sabbath album with Glenn Hughes. And we know what happened after that. So interesting how even with all the excitement of them reuniting at Live Aid, they couldn't quite get that to carry over to do much of anything. Totally. I mean, the, the, <clears throat> and it is interesting, too, to see what a confusing thing. I mean, it would be confusing today, but, you know, back then when there's no internet and, you know, no websites you can go to or Facebook, it's like, okay, so... Ozzy reunites with Sabbath in July and the next thing and it's it's uh, it's Black Sabbath featuring Ozzy Osbourne the next thing people hear is that in January right I believe it was the end of January is a new record called Black Sabbath featuring Tony Iommi <laughs> and, and right around the same time of a new Ozzy solo record yeah. so it's like oh oh wait what I mean it's really you know interesting to go back and look and be like yeah no wonder people were confused and you know while i think the performance was great it probably didn't do tony iomi any any help you know to uh for his solo career to reunite with the original band and then be the sole guy left yeah in a brand new band which i'm sure we'll talk about when we do a, a seven star episode yeah but, you know, like like when Kiss, right? A couple of years ago when Kiss was doing the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and everybody was like, oh, yeah, you know, it really should be Gene and Paul. The four guys should come out. But it's like, yeah, but, you know, G Gene and Paul are not, if they're not going out on the road right now or in the near future with, with Ace and Peter, people are going to all be confused. No different than for Deep Purple. Why Deep Purple didn't do a... A, a live reunion with with Coverdale and Blackmore and everybody else. It's just, you know, logistically, it's just, it's it definitely sends mixed signals. It does, it does, and I, I just think it's incredible looking back, like how quickly they all pivoted back to other things. Yeah, it's like they knew they must have known very very shortly after Live Aid that yeah, this wasn't going to happen beyond this. This was a one off, and that's it. And how. Like I said, how quickly Geezer and Bill just decided to, all right, we're out of here. We're going to do whatever. Yeah. Right? And, and But, you know, Tony, to his credit, was like, well, I'm going to go make music. Right. And, you know, when you really think about it, Chris, just stop and think about it for a second. Knowing the kind of music that Ozzy was making on like Born Again and soon to be Ultimate Sin. Does, does, does that really fit in into the scope of what Sabbath were doing? Right. No. Nope, Again, right. Ozzy wasn't writing a lot of that stuff anyway, so maybe that's totally. maybe that's a non-issue. But it's like if you look, if you listen to the stuff, you know, and I'm talking like from Born Again all the way through the Tony Martin stuff, and even including Seven Star, that's very different from what Ozzy was doing. I think. 
Totally. And, you know, I had heard a, a Tony Iommi interview uh, recently where he had said at Live Aid, you know, when I guess when they were rehearsing, uh, Ozzy asked Tony what he was doing musically, and he had said he was working on a, a, a solo record, which would become Seven Star. And Ozzy had said to Tony, oh, uh, you know, I'm due for a new solo record, but I don't have any material. Do you have anything I could use? And Tony's like, no, I'm working on my own thing, man. Like, I don't have stuff for you. Write your, write your own fucking song. Write your own shit. I don't have to tell you. <laughs> so, yeah, I was, obviously it was Jakey e. Lee and whoever else that wrote all that stuff for him. But, and Jake, 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 what do you, you, what yeah. do you have for me, man? <laughs> and but, Yeah, Jake and Bob Daisley got, got suckered into it into doing all that work but yeah it, it is really interesting you know it's interesting to see too like okay had they had they reunited in in 84 or 85 i mean we wouldn't have gotten seven star or or born again um or, and probably not uh bark at the moon you know depending on you know when when they actually did it although the, the thing i was thinking about pete and i don't know what you think about this but i was like huh I was like, you know, if you think about it, you know, forgetting about the live records, um, at the end of 1982, right, for Tony Iommi and, and, and Geezer Butler, well, they just came off a high of these two records, but, you know, they lost Vinny Appice and they lost Ronnie James Dio. But on, on, the, on the Aussie side, he came off a high of those two great records, but he lost his whole band because he lost he lost Lee Kerslake, he lost Bob Daisley, and tragically lost Randy Rhodes. So it's like, wow! If you really think about it, they should have been on each other immediately. Right? Talk about the stars aligning, especially because it was two and two. I mean, they were still kind of neck and neck. It's not like years later where when they finally did reunite and right, Ozzy was in the stratosphere and sabbath were was yesterday's newspaper and but, is that yeah. more of it is that more of a ozzy even though ozzy's like you said has to put a whole new band together is that more of ozzy thinking well yeah this sucks and i lost my guy right and but i've moved past them already yeah i mean it could, it could rather be, than yeah. saying you know what maybe this is telling right they just they lost two of their guys I've lost my main guy. And, you know, at, at that point, does it really matter who else in the, you know, um, why don't we just kind of kiss and make up and do it? But that, right. I don't ever I, remember hearing that at all. I mean, in going over the re re going, rereading some of the, uh, the Iron Man book, it, Tony Iommi really puts the blame on management management. Yeah. That, you know, Sharon hated her father, did not want to work with her father, so had a terrible know. relationship, and that at at Live Aid, either right before or right after they went on, on, on stage, um, Don Arden, Sharon's father, had Ozzy issued a with a writ, uh, a legal document, some kind of lawsuit thing, because he was afraid that Sabbath was going to reunite with Ozzy with Sharon as the manager, cutting Don Arden out. Uh, and I mean, there, there's a whole chapter in here, a small chapter, but just how Tony says he and Ozzy have always been friends, no matter what, and always will be. Um, which is interesting because, you know, to this day, it seems like Tony is still friends with Geezer and Tony is still friends with Ozzy, but now Ozzy and Geezer don't get along. I just, I just heard that on Ozzy's Boneyard today. Yes. A little clip with Ozzy, and he was saying that he talks to Tony all the time. He talks to Bill pretty often, but he hasn't talked to Geezer in ages. No. And and the blame there, Ozzy says and Geezer says, it's the wives. Because <laughs> Geezer is managed by his wife, Gloria, and Ozzy's managed by his wife, Sharon. So <laughs> something went on there, and yeah, it, it is crazy. Thankfully, Tony, I know he's not managed by his wife, even though she's she's a babe. That's a whole other story. But <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You know, when you look back on it and you think of what could have been and what might have been, and you look at what actually does happen, did happen. Um, 
in in a bizarro world that we don't get born again and seven star and bark at the moon i kind of like that we got all that stuff me too and but maybe just... you know things worked out the way they worked out kind of for the best and yeah. you know, we, we got these guys you know they did the reunion tour obviously much later on we got 13 and I'm I'm kind of okay with it. <laughs> I, I agree, you know, and and I was thinking, you know, this is being completely selfish, but I'm like, okay, my first concert when I was 13, I went to see Ozzy in 1986. I'm like, okay, if they had reunited in 83 or 85, maybe I ha I wouldn't have seen them. And maybe um I'm sure it would have burnt out at some point. So thankfully, right, we did get those records that we did, and then they did the re reunion that they did, which lasted for many years. Yeah. So um, I'm I'm glad the way things worked out. But when I was thinking about it, I'm like, wow, yeah, late '82. That really, that would have been the time logistically if they could have, you know, worked everything out. Yeah. I wonder how many, if you were to like talk to do a poll with like a whole bunch of like Sabbath fans from the very beginning, like, you know, maybe guys that are older than, than me. Right. Right. Um, how many of those like classic era Sabbath fans, you know, the ones that are like no Sabbath without Ozzy type of thing. You have to wonder how many of them have never even listened to the Tony Martin era at all. That's an excellent you know, point. You know, that only came back on board for 13. Yeah. Like, reunion tour. Right. And how many. So, like, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, how many people you have to wonder who claim to be big Sabbath fans basically kind of checked out from, you know, maybe they dig the Dio era albums. But really, for them, after Mob Rules and up until 13, they're just kind of like, ah, these are the lost years who gives a crap, that type of thing, right? You have to wonder. I mean, not everybody's like us. No. They like all the eras, and they they can find things to love about all of them, you know, and whether it sounds like classic Sabbath or not. It's Sabbath, right? For me, if Tony Naomi's there, it's Black Sabbath. That's just the way I think. Agreed. Right? 100%. Um, and some albums are obviously better than others and whatnot. But uh, I just, I, I think there's a good amount of, I remember... You and you may be a part of it. There, there was this Black Sabbath fan page on Facebook that I joined up for a while, but I couldn't stay in there because it was just so toxic. Because there were these people that are like, you know, only Ozzy era Sabbath is Sabbath, and then others that it's only the Dio album and never the two shall meet. And it's just this kind of the, the Martin years are trash, the born again is terrible, and you know, blah blah blah. And it's just like, I think. Yeah, I mean, I know you have that with a lot of bands, but I think with Sabbath, you see that quite a bit. It's, have... it's funny you say that, Pete, because that's exactly where I was going to go. I am in a bunch of these Facebook groups. There's the one that's all eras of Black Sabbath, and there's the one that's the Martin era. There's one that's the Dio era. And yeah, that's the thing. It does get under my skin when it's this constant constant argument of well that's not the real black sabbath or this black sabbath is better than than that black sabbath and i'm always like jesus christ you know what like i love chicken parmesan but i also love a cheeseburger i could love i it doesn't matter i don't have to have the love for just one thing here guys and it doesn't you know it does. It, it, it's 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 quite frankly, you can like a chicken parmesan from Il Tesora. You can like a chicken hundred percent from Stefano's. You can. Everybody makes them a little bit different, but you know That's what? It. Still They're all great. Chicken parmesan, right? They're all great. Right. I mean, I just, I just don't understand it. I mean, you know, because that's the other thing. Like, you could say you don't like the Tony Martin era of Black Sabbath. But you can't say it's not Black Sabbath because they released all these albums with the the title Black Sabbath. They sold all these tickets and all these all these T-shirts that all say Black Sabbath from that era. So you might not like it, but they did it, guy. You can't go back and rewrite history. Sorry, I don't care that you don't like them. It's there. It is there. It is. <laughs>
but that's you know that that's, that's being a more. fan right there's the, you can't yeah. change people's perception of that that's like it's not just black sabbath it's like that with so many others. yes oh thing. for sure i'm i'm not in any van halen ones but i'm sure that's a that's a constant struggle too and actually i'm not in any maiden ones but i'm sure there's stuff with that and hell people are still debating ripper owens who i think is a great singer but so yeah, that's 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 the whole fan. Thing. I know a lot of people who say Maiden ended for them when Deano left. Yes, and that I'm... was a million years ago. Just two forty miles. years ago, no more, right? What year is this? So forty. So yeah, he left in the. He left in eighty one. Eighty one. So that's forty three. Yeah. Oh my god, that's crazy! It's nuts. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. Yeah, you can, just can't win that argument with with everybody, right? No, but no, the... I, absolutely not. But I, I, I'm very glad. And and re, in rewatching the uh, the set, you know, this 15 minute set that they did, I thought they played remarkably well, considering they hadn't played with each other in seven years. But yes, they all Ozzy was playing those songs with his solo band, and Tony and Geezer were playing those songs with um, first with Ronnie and then with Ian Gillen. Yeah. So they were they 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 knew um they knew how to play him. They genuinely looked happy to be up there with each other. Uh, they did. You know, at one point like, Ozzy's like, hanging on Tony Tony yeah. Iommi, and Ozzy's back and forth all on the stage. Yeah, constantly moving. I'll say this, Pete. That was the one thing I did think of when I when I watched because I hadn't seen it in a couple of years. But when I watched it before you and I did the episode, I go, "Holy Jesus! They look like babies." Because that was 1985, so that was 30, almost 30 years ago. Am I, is that right? 85? 85. Because it's 40 years ago, my friend. It'll be, 40, it'll be 40 years next year. Oh my God. Well, I'm not good at math, but that's great. Right, that's crazy. It's 39 years ago. Right. 39 years ago. So well, they, they, looked, they looked great. Yeah. You know, they all looked so young. And yeah. that was the one thing I thought, like, well, if they would have done it, then they would have looked good, but. I, I might not have seen it so selfishly. I'm glad they, they didn't. And I thought Priest played great. And but yeah, that Zeppelin one, holy crap! The Sabbath guys could could hold their heads high, because yeah. they were definitely other than Ozzy's outfit, they were not an embarrassment. If I remember correctly, because uh, like I told you, I was at my uh, my aunt's house, and um, I, w- I was 19, so I was, you know, I was in college at the time. But although it was a summer break. I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly, that I went out and got hammered the night before because it was like Friday night, and that's what I did. Right. And I even think, if I remember correctly, that I cracked open a beer while they were playing in the morning, <laughs> which had had to be like ten After or ten thirty in the morning. Yeah, it was it was ten o'clock. I think they went on at like ten nine fifty something in the morning, which makes sense because I I always mix up if Priest went on. I think Priest went on before them, but I can't I can't remember. But they yeah. were also on early. Yeah, but they weren't they I think they went on even earlier than that. Yeah. They, if I remember correctly, Sabbath were sandwiched by two ridiculous bands that had nothing to do with metal no, of course not, rock yeah. at all. Yeah. So they, they purposely didn't do that. So I remember Priest also had other weird bands around them. Same thing with Zeppelin, even when Queen went on, because I think Queen went on later in the day or middle of the middle of the afternoon or something like that. So the yeah, they 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 tried really hard to mix everybody and not yeah. just have all the metal and heavy bands in one shot. They kind of blended them all in, which I guess kind of makes sense, but it's just weird to see like a, a pop band, then Sabbath, and then like yeah. a reggae band or something like that. It's right, just... you, UB40 and then Judas Priest. <clears throat> yeah. Um, it, yeah. It was interesting too. I, I don't remember this, but Dave LaGreca had, uh, I talked to uh, recently, he had mentioned, which I did not remember, and I guess it was on some of the feeds. He was like, yeah, he remembers watching it on TV and I think he said, I think I could have this wrong, that he didn't have MTV at the time. So he was watching it on one of the other channels. And he said on the screen, they put up the Born Again album. And it said like Black Sabbath, Born Again, Warner Brothers Records. And I'm like, that's so funny. But, you know, obviously that was the newest Black Sabbath record at the time. <laughs> and technically three of the four guys on that stage were on that record. That is that is the case. If you, uh, I came across that last week when I was watching clips and looking up images, there's a uh, 
There is a video of that, and there's also a still photograph that you can find from that transmission ah. that shows the Born Again album cover, which again, which is, yeah, it's just weird, weird. And you know, we didn't even talk about. It. I was thinking about this too. Uh, in Frank White, our buddy Frank White's book, uh, the New Jersey Metal book, he talks about. Uh, did he go get a ride with somewhere? Did he hitchhike? I don't know, but he was, you know, because he was there. He was there. He went there to, then he saw all this firsthand uh, at RFK Stadium in uh, in Philly. And uh, how cool must that have been? He's like, oh. "There's no way I was going to miss that. No way I'm going to miss." Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And yeah, Frank, his we should have him on 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 the show for some at some point to talk some some Sabbath stories because he's 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 seen all the lineups. But yeah, I do remember talking to him about Live Aid, and yeah, I remember he said it was it was a it was a hot one, and he I, if I remember right that he got towards the, the front of the stage and he didn't leave. He was there Stuck he in, was that in the spot. same spot all day. Yeah. And I'm like, oh mm. my God. I'm he sure. That. Oh, I, I can't. Hydrate and got a piss and just like, oh, it's God. Yeah. And you know, it's funny watching it now. It's really interesting to see the audience, how a huge amount of the audience is wearing white. You know, today everybody would be wearing, you know, at a Black Sabbath concert, day or night, it would be everybody, myself included, would be in black T-shirts. Yeah, very smart of them. Well, they knew how hot it was going to be, so it yeah. makes total sense. Yeah. Well, and I also think too, I, I I would just imagine back then, you know, the only place you got black T-shirts was the concert. Yeah. yeah. And even then, you remember Pete, lots of times the shirts weren't always black; they were grays, and there was whites and whites or black and white. You know, the yeah. white white sleeves the sleeves yeah yeah but yeah i was interested to see how many people had white t-shirts or white baseball hats i was like huh that is pretty interesting yeah they were smart yeah well, we're not always that smart right no no for, no for sure <laughs> they weren't the metal fans in the new audience wearing the white right now that's true and listen i'm sure that you know some of them knew sabbath and some of them were there for sabbath and priest but yeah i'm sure it was a very mixed audience yeah I'm yeah. sure the people that were there for Madonna were, were not there for Black Sabbath. And it's funny, I completely forgot in, in the in the the Sabbath book, or the, the Tony Iommi book rather, it said that when they, you know, the day before when they were doing a rehearsal, he said uh, some some girl with dark hair comes in and was watching them rehearse. And he called over one of the security guards. He's like, hey, tell that girl. It's uh, this is a closed rehearsal. I don't know who she is, but you got to get her out of here. He said he found out later that it was Madonna who had dyed her hair dark. He's like, I don't know who the hell she was. He's like, I just didn't want her watching us rehearse. Like, that <laughs> That's weird, right? Yeah, because yeah. 1985. I mean, Madonna's starting to get big, but she's yeah. not as enormous as she would be. Like what a year later? Yes, absolutely. Plus, <laughs> if she dyed her hair, okay, who's this broad? Get her out of here. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I thought that was pretty pretty funny. Yeah. So it's cool reminiscing about this stuff once again. Um, a you know kind of like a interesting time in the history of Black Sabbath, and uh, for everybody watching, uh, we we've already kind of talked a little bit about what we're going to cover in our next episode. And Chris mentioned Dave Lagreca before, so yeah, Dave, Chris, and I are all good friends. And uh, Dave sent us a text a couple weeks ago, talking about some uh, Sabbath songs that he really likes that. Chris and I don't think are all that very good from the later part of the catalog and specifically from Forbidden. Uh, so we figured we'd uh, we put together an episode where we invite Dave on and we talk about some of these songs. Like, do they really suck or are they any good? And we want Dave to kind of present his case for why these are why he considers these classic Sabbath songs. And I'm sure we'll, we'll fit some other stuff into the episode as well. So that'll be uh, coming up probably uh, in May, uh, which is right around the corner. So we'll yeah. try and get, try and get that one a little quicker than it took us to get this one. So, you know, it's always, it's always hard to get schedule these things and, you know, whatnot, but, uh, and maybe by then, um, now well, the, the, the Anno Dominate set doesn't come out till later in the month. Yeah, and that comes up. We'll talk about that. Probably do a review, probably the June episode. Yeah, exactly. So, Yeah. Anyway, uh, any last words? Uh, you you got? Um, did, you said, did you get any new uh, Sabbath bootlegs before we let everybody? Um, I, you know, I I had them. Uh, I have them in my car. Rec uh, I've been listening to both of them. Uh, they're really good. I'm I'm sure I'll uh, bring them up whenever we do the Seven Star episode. Okay. But I got two two double discs. Uh, one is the um, 
the, 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 it's the very first gig on the seven star tour, which, um, gosh, is that, I think it's Cleveland, Ohio. And of course that's Glenn Hughes. And yep. I think that's like March of 1986. And then in May of 1986, it's the very last gig of the seven star tour period, but that's a double disc with Ray Gillen. Yeah. And the, the, the quality <clears throat> on the Ray Gillen one is, is excellent. And it's, it's interesting because um, they changed a bunch of songs and there's quite a bit of material on the Glenn Hughes one that they quickly dropped, you know, songs like angry heart um, or iron man. Uh, they played one, this one time with Glenn Hughes and they cut it. And I was fascinated because I had heard, cause I had some Glenn Hughes bootlegs and they're pretty terrible. As you know, Pete, um, I had heard that this was the best Glenn ever sounded on the five dates he did with Sabbath. And it's true. Some of the songs he does, he sounds pretty good. I mean, there's a good amount of the material that he struggles with, to be honest. Um, but it was really interesting to see, or I should say to hear, you know, the Glenn Hughes fronted version of Sabbath play like almost a two hour set with all these songs that were quickly dropped from the seven star tour. Yeah. Yeah, it's a shame, man. I because I, I remember I was at that New Jersey show, and man, he yeah. was, he was terrible. He was just up there croaking away, and I'm just. And what surprised me too is like he was singing the stuff from Seven Star worse than everything else. Yeah, and I'm like, he should be singing that shit the best because that's the stuff that he recorded on. Yeah, I was like, what is going on here? You know, it's just yeah. It was... Well, I, I got to say, you know, that's the, uh, from, from having interviewed Glenn a couple times, you know, to me, that's the one thing that, man, I would, I, if it's possible to do, to see, you know, Iomi and Hughes do a, a handful of gigs, I won't even say a tour. Um, man, talk about, because Glenn Hughes that. is so good now. Yeah, you know, a lot of people talk about, oh. Yeah, I, I would love to see Tony Martin. And I'm like, no, you know what? I've seen the, the Martin Sabbath. It was really good. But Glenn Hughes is the one that uh, Sabbath fans owe it to him. And he feels like he owes it to Sabbath fans. And they have so much material, right? They have Seven Star and the two solo records. I mean, and Glenn Hughes at his age sounds phenomenal. Yeah. I, it, it makes total sense you know you do you do selections from seven star you do stuff from the the later albums they did together and then you do maybe a couple ronnie songs and a couple ozzy songs boom yeah. there's your boom. Show. that's it there's you, your, your you whole three show or four or five dates and that's it yeah I, I would love it and i'll be honest i did just hear uh because glenn hughes just released a few more dates in for the fall of his uh deep purple tour in America, he's doing he's doing uh, two dates in Jersey, and I think maybe a date in Buffalo. There wasn't a lot, but he's doing one more round. And he said, "This is it for him in uh, 2024. That's it. He's finished with Purple." Um, and of course, Eddie Trunk did bring up Tony Iommi, and he's like, "You know, I I still talk to Tony all the time." He go and all he would say is that he goes, "Well, Tony, Kenny Aronoff, and myself." have talked about something, but I'm not at liberty to say yet. So whether that means a, a couple shows or record, who knows? Usually when you hear that, I'm not at liberty to say anything yet, that means something's happening. Something. Yeah. That's and cool. I mean, it's like the Sabbath farewell tour. Gosh, what year was that? Was that I'm my old age, Pete? Was that 2016? Yeah. yeah 15 into 16. Yeah. 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 So it's like, okay, it's it's been a long time since if Tony's healthy and can do a couple gigs. And Glenn has talked about doing another solo record next. Yes. So I wonder if Tony's going to be helping out on that. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of disappointing that we're not going to get a full-on Black Country Communion tour because they've got the new album coming out. Yes, that's an excellent point. You, you kind of knew that was, you know. Yeah, I mean, Joe Joe Bonamassa is just so busy on his own, and that's so yeah. lucrative for him. So that's not surprising, but uh, yeah, 
But yeah, we'll so see. That, be I would love to, to hear something else between Glenn and Tony. Yes, my, myself, uh, I completely agree. Not to take anything away from Tony Morton, but yeah, uh, that's what I would rather see uh, if I could see one of the ex Sabbath singers team team up with with Tony Iommi even for a limited basis. Yeah, it'd be, it would be Glenn Hughes. Yeah, because you are one hundred percent correct. We want we want to see the real Glenn Hughes and Tony Iommi yes. together. Right. What, now, we got, what we got for those couple of dates way back then. Yeah. You know, Glenn was not in a good place and uh, it was just not a good time. And now would be the good time. Oh, now would be a, a, a great time. Yeah. So, yeah, fing good. fingers crossed. There we go. Fingers crossed for that to happen. So, uh, here, that wraps up another episode of the Sabbath Stones. Everybody, thanks for joining us and uh, listen to us chit chat about our favorite band of all time. We'll be back again next month for another episode. Like I said, we're going to bring David LaGreca with us uh, from busted open radio on Sirius XM. Dave's a big Sabbath fan as well. So we're going to, we're going to grill him why he thinks uh, some of these songs that maybe we're not too keen on are Sabbath classics, but we'll get to that when we happen. So, and uh, anyway, visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on YouTube all together, all the damn all the time. time. Please subscribe if you haven't already and click on that notification bell so you get alerted of all of our content as a post. And please hit the like button before you leave. Uh, maybe next time also we'll show off some uh, recent Sabbath bootlegs we've gotten as well. We'll kind of circle back on that again because I think I have a couple new ones as well. So uh, till then, for Chris Allo, I and P. Pardo, thanks for watching, everybody. Tune in in just a little while for the Monsters Den. Till then, have a good one, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.